Yay, welcome back everyone. So I guess today the plan is to go over some example papers that use some different forms of regression modeling as part of their quantitative analysis uh, and hopefully dissect them and critique them and uh, learn something about how to best apply the method on some particular data sets or given specific research questions or learn about um, threads and pitfalls to avoid uh, from these examples. So I've selected, I don't know, five or so papers. You have all, well, five of you have volunteered to present them. So I'm happy to go in any, any order you want. Uh, the plan is to spend class today uh, listening to your presentations of these papers first and then having a discussion, a group discussion after every paper. So critiquing the design and the method. That's the idea. Oh, um, if you need more time for the homework assignment, that's fine. Just submit it late. It's not a problem. Uh, the regression assignment. Uh, there has been some new information yesterday in the office hour that you might find helpful. I've posted the R script and the video from that discussion. Um, you can find the details in the Slack channel if you're looking for those. So if you need more time to incorporate some of these things into your submissions, that's fine. Just, uh, just do that. Right. All right. So who wants to go first? I'm looking at CJ. <laughs> okay. okay, I can I can do first. So uh, I, I do have slides to, to share. So can I? Yes, please. I, I think you should be able to. Yeah. Okay. So, so can you see my slides? Right. Yep. Yeah. So, so, um, uh, I'm responsible for this paper on the distributed distributed development of that software quality and empirical study on Windows Vista. Uh, so, so the background is that um, so distributed collaboration means like uh, we develop um, a, a software like in kind of distributed, not like work in the in uh, in the same same building something like that. So. So conventionally, they people have the beliefs that uh, there are some challenges in uh, distributed collaboration. So, for example, like delayed feedback, restricted communication, less shared awareness, or lack of trust or confidence, and and people believe that this will finally lead to poor software quality. So this paper uh, want to kind of uh, study whether this is true or not. So um, to be more specifically, um, uh, their, their object is um, globally distributed software development within the same company because like distributed uh, collaboration has kind of different meaning under different contexts. So they restrict the, the research object to kind of um, uh, globally distributed so uh, software development within, within the same company. And their research question is to decide whether uh, globally distributed software development development leads to more software failures. So in this context, they, they measure uh, software quality only by uh, failures. And they have two hypotheses, and, and also they, they want to introduce the complexity here. So I will, I will explain it later. So they have two hypotheses here. So the first, uh, they want to figure out binaries that are developed by teams of engineers that are distributed will have more post-release failures than those developed by co-located uh, co engineers. So post-release failures uh, means that uh, after the, the, the software is released, they kind of collect the, 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 the kind of the failure report from the end users. And they have a second hypothesis is that binaries that are distributed will be less complex, exper uh, experienced less code churn and have fewer dependencies that, than co co-located binaries. So uh, I draw this diagram here to kind of use what we learned in the, in the course. So they want to find the cause and cause and effect relationship between globally distributed developments uh, and software quality, especially failures. But uh, it is also possible we know that software complex, like a more complex software may, may lead to kind of poor software quality. So they also want to remove the the, the effects of the, the software complexity. So in their, 
in their second hypothesis, they want they, they just try to kind of they just try to re, like make sure that um, the the software developed by by kind of globally distributed development team uh, uh, globally distributed teams are not kind of significantly more or like significantly less complex than 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 those developed by co uh, co located uh, teams. So that's that's their research questions. And so they uh, they use Windows Vista as their case study. So because um, Microsoft has nearly 3,000 developers across 59 buildings uh, and 21 campus in Asia, Europe, and North America. And the Windows Vista is developed main, like only in, in Microsoft, no, outsour uh, no outsourcing. And also Windows Vista contains more than 3,300 uh, unique binaries and over 60 million line of codes. And <clears throat> so for the to decide like they they they, they to decide the, like how to measure distributed development they use a um, geographical location of developers from 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 their HR assistants and then they use the the commits uh, of those binaries to decide whether uh whether uh, so they so they use binary as a kind of a uh, uh the the unit for for software and then they 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 use a standard, they use this information to decide to kind of categorize the, the binaries into the into six uh, distribution levels. So they have building, cafeteria, campus, lo uh, locality, continent, and world. So so for example, building means the, the binary is uh, is mainly developed by developers within the same building. And so for campus means like the, the, the binary is developed by developers in the same in the same campus. And then they have this, this kind of six level of distribution levels and then they kind of decide, so they, they use kind of five different uh, splits. So for example, for, for A, it means that uh, less than A means like for only buildings, they consider them as distributed. And for any other levels greater than A, they consider, oh no, sorry, uh, the other side. So so for for for, for like, for level less than A, like for building, uh, they, 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 they treat them as uh, developed by uh, co-located teams. And for, for levels greater than A, uh, they, they think the, the, the binary is developed by distributed teams. So, and then for software quality, they collect uh, post-release failures, uh, like, within, like within six months after, the, after, the, after Windows Vista is released. And for, for, for complexity, they collect a lot of metrics. And like, for, for example, for size and complexity, they have line of codes, number of functions, and, 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 and they collect test coverages, dependencies, and also number of people working on the binary. So I'm, I'm just gonna skip this, the, the details of the metrics here. Now, I think this is what we want to discuss more here. So they use regression model to decide the, the, the relationship between failures and distributed. So they have four regression model. So in the first in their first model, they they want they use they use distributed, uh, they use the, the binary value, like whether the, the binary is developed by distributed teams to to kind of to predict failures. And 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 in this table they show that um, if the if the if the binary is developed by distributed teams, the uh, the fail, they have they have kind of nine percent increase in in the failure rate, and in the second model they introduce another variable that is the number of developers, and then they have this table here they interpret it as if we fix the number of developers, the and if we fix the number of developers, and if the binary is developed by distributed teams, uh, the the failure rate increased by four point six percent. So that's how they interpret the, the answer here. So so my understanding is so so it looks like a number of developers is kind of a moderator variable here because it changes. So based on their interpretation, it changes the the kind of the extent of how 
distributed uh, teams will affect the, the surface quality. Let, let's pause here for a second, CJ. That's a good, yeah. that's a good question. Do people agree with this? I think it's probably a mediator instead of a moderator. No, well, my understanding is mediator means the disrupt the distributed teams will affect number of developers, and number of developers will then affect failures, right? That's mediator, right? Yes. Well, I'm but but I don't think um, number of developers is related to so because you can have a you can have a big team that is distributed, but you can also have a small team that is also distributed. Yes, it's possible, but based on this model, there is no interaction effect. So I think my interpretation of these two result is that um, the the net uh, whether being distributed have uh, if you, if you plot it as a causal graph uh, that uh, number of this being distributed the team or not have two. Uh, direct chains to the final outcome, which is whether they are failure or not. The first one is being distributed itself has a direct effect. The second one is that uh, being distributed correlates with the number of developers and the number of developers correlates with whether being fa whether uh, having failure or not. So uh, the second chain have half of the effect. So if you model the number of developers add the number of developers in that the effect size will decrease from 9.2 to 4.6 because the other half was captured by the other chain. That, that's, that's my interpretation. Mm -hmm. Do people agree? What do you think? Yeah, well, so 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 in fact, like um, so so if we if we if we if we kind of if we just see this formula here, right? So so I write in like in the in the way we use in R, like there I, I believe their their model is like they use distributed and plus number of developers, but I mean their interpret interpretation sounds like they are treated treat it as a moderator because like they are saying that if we fix the number of developers, then the the extent of the decrease is decreased, right? So that's so. So that's why I kind of have a question mark here. Yes, I'm not sure. Does anybody remember the definition of a moderator? How did we describe it or define it? Moderator, or I guess between. Well, let's say DNF, the moderator doesn't act between it, but it controls like the strength and direction. Right. So I guess one way to read that would be that for depending on the value of the number of developers variable, the relationship between distributed and failures changes in strength. Right. So if I have if num developers equals two, then say the the strength of the relationship between distributed and failures is different from when the number of developers equals 200 would be so the definition of a moderator. So um, a moderator pretty much has to be independent of the other of the other variable, right? A meter is a dependent variable, right? That affects the so if distributed was, um, if, if number of devs was um, a mediator, it would be dependent on distributed here. Is that true? Yes. And I think Bobo was arguing that right. you know, it, it could be. Right. It's, like it's, not, it's not always going to be, but you know, it, it could be, or it could be on average, right? It's, there will always be exceptions, but it could be that, um, when you're distributed, you have more developers or, or you have fewer on average or something like that. Like there's some plausible dependency there, relationship. So, but, so let, me, let me go back to this interpretation. That was important uh, for a second. The, the moderator, the way to think about it is to, 
uh, as something that changes the strength of the relationship between distributed and failure. So that's the relationship relationship of interest here is distributed and failure is this one. Right, that's the one we care about. And if numdevs would be a moderator, depending on the value of numdevs, numdevs, the strength of this relationship would vary as well. So here, right, when, uh, when CJ interpreted this model, he interpreted it as saying, fixing numdevs, we get 4.6 more failures on average when we're distributed. Okay, so notice how that seems incompatible with this interpretation of, uh, depending on the value of numdevs, we get a different relationship between distributed and failures. Okay, so CJ assumes that the relationship between distributed and failures is always the same, is always this 4.6% increase on average, irrespective of the value of numdevs. Right, you're saying, you know, no matter what you fix numdevs to, you get 4.6% more failures on average. Whereas if it were a moderator, um, the interpretation would be slightly different. It would be, you know, if numdevs is two, maybe you get 4.6%, but if it's 200, maybe you get 20%, right? So there, it's sort of somewhat different, right? It matters what the value of non-devs is to determine what this coefficient is for, for distributed. Okay, so I'm, I think I'm gonna side with Bobo on this one and call this one a mediator, if anything. But, but not a moderator and we don't have, it could, it could be, but we don't have evidence from the model as specified that it is. We would sort of have to look at the interaction term, the interaction effect between them to make that a claim to, to be able to support that interpretation. Does I that make sense? Mm -hmm. Because right, here we are assuming that this 4.6% is independent of the value of non-devs, and that is incompatible with the definition of a moderator. That makes sense. All right, all right. Thanks. Let's let's go on. Yeah. Okay. So, well, they have another regression model, but they just use um, they 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 introduce a different kind of independent, they introduce different kind of independent variables. So they use this diff x. Also, so, 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 so the basic idea is simple here, uh, is, is similar here. So here we just, they just have kind of a binary value that is whether it is distributed or not. Here they kind of break it into five or five or six, five different like variables. So like for diff x means like for diff, for diff buildings, it means that uh, developers are in the same building, but not in the same cafeteria, which which is uh, which is the upper level. If we go back to the page here, so it means like diff diff building means they work in the same building, but not in the same, uh, but not the same cafeteria. And then the increase here is compared with the uh, the developers in the same building. I think so. Basically, uh, how to interpret the table here is. Uh, if the if the binary is developed in the let's say in the same building but not but not the same cafeteria, the the failure rate will increase by fifteen percent. I think that's how. So so basically it's similar. And then they also have another model by adding the number of developers. And then um, which I think is is interesting that is that so so. They try to remove the the possible kind of effect of complexity here, but they do not use regression model. They just simply use correlation model, and then they decide that there are no significant difference between the complexity of for binaries developed by distributed teams and uh, collocated teams, um, which is kind of interesting. So if we if we think number of developers are also mediator here and complexity is also mediator here. Uh, so then I have a question why they not just put those variables in the regression model altogether. Right. 
why not? Why why they why they choose to use this kind of Spearman rank correlation? Why they just kind of put in a in a big mod and then maybe the result they were hoping to claim would have gone away if they had done that. So they chose a different analysis that supported their conclusion. I see, but so like. I'm, I'm, I, yeah, I, it's I'm interesting. Sorry, <laughs> so, I'm absolutely joking. I have no evidence yeah. to support that. Yeah, so so because in the in their complexity measurements, they also have like number of people, right? So so you can think of number of people is one of the complexity measurements. And they put the number of developers in this model, but not but not other metrics. So so that's interesting. Um and then I think so so okay, now this is wrong. Uh, so because we have discussed this. So number of developers should be. Uh, so okay. So so now it, so now if we kind of talk about the the, so because uh because like, bubble say like uh we think number of developers are mediator, but they have they kind of have proved that there are no significant correlation between, uh distributed and number of developers. So should we remove the line here? So it means number of developers is just kind of one possible other cause here. And uh, for the threat to validity, it could be like, there are other mediators like bad communication. So distributed teams will result, will, will, will result in bad communication or cultural difference and then result in software quality. And, but they didn't, well, they didn't find a measurement for, for it, I guess. And also we may have other, well, I'm not sure like it should be moderator or, or other causes here. Like, like what if they have, what if Microsoft has some special process management or development configuration? This may, this may directly, re, like this may directly kind of uh, affect software quality or you could be a moderator here. So I'm not sure, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but that's that's all I have for for, for for the paper. So I guess what you're saying is they um they don't talk too much about the mechanism, right? So we don't know exactly through which mechanism this relationship between distribution and being distributed and quality manifests itself. Is it because of bad communication? Is it because of other things? They can at best observe this relationship, but they don't really know why it happens, right? That's sort of... Yeah, yeah. One, one thing to add that's, I think, really worth mentioning is, so the historical context in which this paper appeared, um, I don't know if you mentioned that. When did the paper uh, get published? Do you remember that? Um, no, I can't. Uh, oh, well, you have the, in the slide, right? Uh, uh, Sorry, I can't see it. So 2009, right? Mm -hmm. So that was kind of in the early days of um, empirical research in software engineering and mining software repositories and these sort of statistical analyses of, of data sets and so on. Right. So I think um, I think the author should get a lot of credit for sort of doing something that seems very standard now, um, maybe even imperfect. But doing this, you know, before anybody sort of started doing this, um, so I think you know I, I would give them a little bit of slack because of um, being very early and in, in doing something like this, right? So back then, this entire idea of evidence-based software engineering was very, very new, right? There were very few people that were sort of thinking of collecting data to support claims like these and to test hypotheses like these. What do you think about the design in general? Do you see any threats to validity beyond what we already described, discussed? Um, the design. Um... One thing that stands out to me is that it seems the framing of the paper and the writing is very causal. So, so if the, the language used is somewhat causal as, as best I could tell from your presentation, right? They're making these causal claims of the relationship between global distribution and, and failures and defects, but maybe the methodology they used to 
collect evidence in favor of those causal claims doesn't really support that entirely, right? Because ultimately these kind of regression models uncover and, and estimate correlations, associations between variables, but they're not really designed to uncover causal relationships. Mm. That makes sense, right? So, we, you know, we talked about these randomized experiments um, at length in a few lectures ago. And so, for example, an alternative design here that would have allowed the authors to make stronger causal claims would have involved a randomized experiment where you have, I don't know, the same system assigned to be built by either distributed teams or um, co-located teams and you sort of observe there are many examples of this. And so on average, you see whether the distributed teams tend to make more mistakes or something when they uh, build essentially the same system, right? There's lots of confounding factors here that they, uh, you know, they did their best to, to control for, but it's harder to do that with an observational study like this one than it would be with a randomized experiment. Mm. So to me, that would be maybe the, um, you know, if, if I were to criticize something in the, in the paper would be that um, I think the claims are maybe a bit too strong for the kind of analysis methods they, that they're using. Any more thoughts on this? Do we move on to the next one? So just a question. Um... If perchance the author didn't want to go for like a causal, um, like for causal explanation, would they need to do more modeling in the sense to fix this, or um, how would they, how should they restructure the, um, their experiment to try to go for a causal explanation? You mean um, assuming you can't do a randomized experiment, right? Yeah. Let's say, like, how would you go about doing? Um, an observational study that would allow you to make stronger claims or closer to causal claims. Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent question. We will actually talk about this in more detail next week. Uh, I will offer some designs that get you closer to causal claims using observational data. So non experiments, you can't do really do experiments, but something that gives you more confidence. So remember there were three elements to a causal relationship. What were they? Um, it has to happen before, mm -hmm. prior One. before the effect. Um, it has to, you have to exclude all other potential uh -huh. causes. Uh -huh. And uh, the cause must have a correlation to the effect. Mm -hmm. So it seems here that they were able to show two of the three at best, right? They are able to show some correlation and they um, maybe even have this temporal precedence because they measure bugs after release and they measure these properties before the thing was released. So there's some temporal precedence there, but it's not 100% clear that they've excluded all possible alternative explanations, right? There's so still, stuff here that could have gone wrong presumably you know we could talk in, in more detail about that but i don't want to spend all lecture dissecting just this one paper that's sort of the idea with any observational study that you can't really always exclude these plausible alternative explanations as best you you would want to um, so we have a couple of designs that do a little bit better than than this one at getting you closer to causality, but no design is as good as a randomized experiment so that you'll just have to live with that. Sounds good. All right. All right, let's do the next one. Who wants to go next? How about let's change uh, domain a bit. So let's do one of the non software papers next. Looking at uh, you, Austin. I can... Oh, or Sam. Oh yeah, sure. I can I can do that. I can go next. Yeah. So um, my paper is about, or the paper I'm presenting is about uh college students' use of Wikipedia, mm -hmm. which is not software, um, and it's also very um, interesting. 
so uh, let's see okay uh, right so uh, so yeah this is um uh, this is a paper in uh, 2009 uh, published in 2009 I believe they did the um, the the surveys in 2008 um, and uh, just as a context, Wikipedia was, um, I believe, um, introduced in 2001. Uh, so it was sort of in its early stage. Um, and so, yeah, so this paper is about how college students use Wikipedia. And uh, I'll be focusing on the regression models and, and what they find there. Uh, so the motivation here is that um, uh, the popularity of Wikipedia, um, especially in the academic community, has been growing. Um, at that time has been growing since its creation. And also um, some pr prior study um, find that um, it's actually very popular among the well-educated and co especially college students. Um, and uh, on the other hand, um, studies have also shown that there are some concerns regarding the quality of its information. Uh, so the sort of the large gap here is that uh, very few studies have, um, uh, have studied how uh, college students use Wikipedia. Uh, especially how, uh, how college students use Wikipedia and how they perceive the inf uh, quality of information of, um, of Wikipedia. Uh, and also why people, uh, why college students use Wikipedia, choose to use Wikipedia despite um, the, sort of the perception of maybe a lot of best quality of information and also the anonymous uh, authorship uh, property of Wikipedia. So the, so the research question um, so the research questions uh, they focus on uh, are these four. Um, so first one is how do college uh, college students use Wikipedia, and second one is how do college students perceive the information quality of Wikipedia. Third one is to what extent are college students confident in uh, their ability to evaluate the information quality of Wikip Wikipedia, and then lastly, uh, why do college students choose to use Wikipedia? Uh, so they did a survey study. Uh, and, and it surveyed some students uh, in one university in the U U.S. And um, they have a bunch of uh, survey questions. And some of the survey questions, they sort of labeled as uh, explore, exploratory questions. And they, they mainly focused on the um, descriptive statistics for those questions to answer the first three uh, research questions here. So how do college students use Wikipedia? How do they perceive the information quality? And how... How do they think they can evaluate the information quality? And then they have another set of variables or another set of uh, questions uh, where um, from which they obtain variables for the regression modeling for the fourth research questions. Why, research question, why do college students use Wikipedia? And I'll be focusing on talking about that next. Uh, so the theoretical framework here is that they use this thing called social cognitive theory. Uh, in which um, this term self-efficacy um, is, is, um, is thought to be the, um, it, it, which is defined as one, one's ability to, or one's uh, belief in the capacity to perform a course of action, uh, which is believed to be the, the, central, uh, the, the central explanation for human motivation for any human behavior. And then um, uh, there's prior, prior study which identified uh, four aspects of self-efficacy. Uh, first one, uh, and, and they, they use these as the sort of the independent variables. Um, and uh, so these are the four, um, four aspects. Uh, the first one is called master, mastery experience, which is basically a student's path, past experience using Wikipedia. So whether they have a good past experience or not. And the second one is vicarious re um, experience. Uh, which is the student's indirect experience through the observations of others using Wikipedia. And then the third one is verbal persuasions from others, uh, which just means that the um, basically others um, verbal influence uh, on, on using of Wikipedia. So what they hear from, from other people. And then finally, the physiological effective states or in the, in the study, they uh, labeled as emotional condition, uh, basically um, the emotional state of, um, of the, of the students using Wikipedia, and then in addition to these four, um, for these four sort of um, um, variables uh, derived from the social cognitive theory, uh, they also considered two other independent variables, which is 
uh, disposition to information and information utility. Uh, so these two, they also find from pre previous studies, uh, sort of derived from previous studies. So the disp disposition to information um, is defined as the student's tendency to believe unfamiliar information they find on Wikipedia. And then the information utility is defined as the ease of use of the information from Wikipedia. Um, and then the finally, they have the outcome expectation, uh, which is defined as the expected information quality or the um, benefits, ex expected benefits that students um, can be ob obtained, uh, students can obtain from the information uh, from Wikipedia. And they use this as a, um, as not, well, I'll, I'll talk about that next. So they use, um, that's interesting. That's interesting. I'll exit the presentation mode. I'll just uh, do this. Yeah, I'll just do that. Uh, let's see. Yeah, yeah. So, so, um, yeah. So, as you can see here, um, we have the past experience, vicarious experience, verbal persuasion, and emotional states. So, these four are the variables, uh, or the the independent variables, they derived from the social cognitive cognitive theory. And then disposition to information and information utility, these two are the additional variables they considered. And then they think that the, all of these variables affect what's called the outcome expectation, which is the expected outcome. Um, and then they also think that this is a, um, they, they, they um, hypothesize that this is a mediator for the actual use of Wikipedia. Um, so the use is basically um, uh, defined by um, by the frequency of use, which they surveyed um, from the um, from from the respondents. Um, so, yeah. So the the idea is that all of these variables influence the outcome expectation, which is the mediator. Uh, with that influence the um, use of Wikipedia, the frequency of use, um, and the um, right. And these are the the survey. These are the survey items they used, uh, basically for the past experience. Basically for each of these variables or con conceptual variables, they have a bunch of survey questions. So um, this is basically uh, sort of like a, um, I believe this would be a liquor scale, and, and they used a, a seven um, or one to seven scale. So um, the, the, the minimum is uh, one and then the maximum is seven and, and they have the mean and they also tested the Cronbus alpha, which is the, um, the reliability of the scale. So a high Cronbus alpha or close to one means that the scale is reliable, which means that um, these questions um, are indeed measuring the same concept. And for the outcome expectation, which is their meet, uh, which they thought as a mediator, they also have a bunch of questions, um, which they use to measure this concept. And then the use is just the frequency of use um, of Wikipedia for the student in the past semester. Okay. So um, yeah, so the hypothesis of the regression is basically that um, each of these factors, each of those independent factors um, is positive, positively related to the outcome expectation. And then they, um, they believe that outcome expect expectation is a mediator and it is also related to the actual use of Wikipedia. So now let's go into the regression. Uh, so they have four regression models as well. Uh, the first regression model tests the um, the factors that are the independent variables and the outcome expectation. So, uh, so this, this is not considering the actual use. Um, these are the outcomes, or the, sorry, these are the independent variables they identified. Um, so, past experience, vicarious experience, verbal persuasion, emotional state, disposition to information and information utility. And all of these, um, they're, uh, they're testing their impact on the outcome expectation, which is the mediator, or which they, they believe as they hypothesize as the mediator. And then for this one, they find that, um, as you can see here, past experience and emotional states are the two strongest um, predictors for the outcome expectation. And disposition to information and information utility is also um, related. 
I, I've never seen a, an R squared value that high. That's very interesting. Yeah, yeah, that's um, that is very interesting. I also noticed that. Um, I um, I didn't, I, but I didn't notice if they have they if they actually discuss this. Okay, so the next one is um, this one is uh, that they try to see if the outcome or the independent variables directly how they directly related to the actual use of Wikipedia. So this is so you don't see the mediator here. So they don't. This is, this is not considering the mediator. Uh, these are the again. These are the independent variables. But the dependent variables here is the use instead of the mediator. Uh, and this is interesting because if we just look at this, um, it's only that the emotional state and the information utility is um, correlated. And also the R square is here is, is much lower. So just to just for comparison, um, previously uh, we have um, past experience, emotional state, um, disposition to information and ut information utility. So so all four four of these factors um, they are correlated. And then in the next one, only emotional state and information utility are um, significant predict predictors. So another thing that's interesting they point out is that information utility continue to be a uh, significant predictor. So now uh, next uh, they are uh, they next they try to uh, try to establish um, the mediator effect of the um, of the of the, uh, the what they hypothesize as the mediator, which is the outcome expectation variable. Uh, so f um, basically uh, the uh, the requirement for establishing a mediator is that um, the first of all the initial independent variables um, should be correlated with the mediator and that is our first regression as we can see here uh, i mean some of the in in initial um, some of the initial um, independent variables are correlated um, these two are not and then the second requirement is that the mediator um, must also affect the dependent variable. So there's a, there should be a correlation between the outcome expectation and the actual use frequency of Wikipedia. And one thing they note here is that a simple correlation between these two is not sufficient. So this is from previous study. Um, it, it said that uh, we must also, when we look at the second requirement, which is when we look at the a correlation between the mediator and the actual dependent variable, the use of Wikipedia, we must also include all of the initial independent variables as control. So they did that. I mean, they, they did two regressions um, to sort of demonstrate that, uh, which is, so the first one, as you can see here, this is only the correlation between outcome expectation, which they thought as the mediator and the use which is the out uh, the, the the eventual dependent variable and as you can see here um they are significantly correlated um but when we include all of the initial independent variables as control as you can see here the last line here which is the outcome expectation which they um hypothesize to be the mediator now they are not significantly correlated and then, uh, what's also interesting here is that when we include everything, so when we include um, the in, all of the independent variables as well as the mediator as an independent variable itself, only information utility, utility is now a significant predictor. Everything else just uh, the effect just disappeared. So just as a summary. It's it's very sad. They uh, had so much built up, uh, and then it then didn't work out. Yeah, yeah. It's um, it it's sort of uh, anticlimactic, um, but uh, but but still, it's it's quite interesting. The result, uh, just as summary, um, when all of the independent variables, including the mediator, are considered, only information utility um is related to actual Wikipedia use, uh, which is what they find in the regression. Oh, in the in the last regression model, uh, uh, which means that again, outcome expectation did not actually play the mediator role, 
And also, this、uh, raises doubt about whether it's actually applicable to、um, to use social cognitive theory to explain Wikipedia,、um, because when we,、uh, if you recall,、um, the social、uh, cognitive theory. Uh, help them derive these first four、um, independent variables. So these first four independent variables are derived from social cognitive theory, and then the other ones they just、um, added from、um, other parts of the theory of the use of information on the internet.、Um, and, and as you can see here, all of these four variables they are that they don't have a significant effect. Yeah. So this is the.、Um, Basically, the the main results that they get from the these four regression modeling, um, and um, they they did actually identify some of the sort of the limitations of what they did there.、Uh, one thing they note is that the research model includes,、um, again, other variables in addition to those derived from the social cognitive theory. So、um, they suspect that maybe that actually、um, somehow.、Um, Maybe they shouldn't, you know. Maybe they sh just shouldn't have done that. Like that, maybe somehow,、um, somehow changes whether it's actually、um, applicable to use social cognitive theory. So I guess they wonder if they just like, they just use the, you know, just pure social cognitive theory. Like what would happen、uh, for that?、Um, and another thing they note, which is、um, I believe is also a threat to sort of exper external validity, is that.、Um, They only the survey only comes from、um, uh, one class of students. I believe that I, I think that's、um, I believe they they surveyed maybe a freshman or junior. I don't I don't exactly remember. And also only from、um, I believe the certain certain majors.、Um, I believe it was English or communication or something. And it's also only from one university.、Uh, so that is a sort of a narrow demographic,、uh, and. One example they gave that might、um, might be sort of a, a hidden、uh, influence is that maybe their professor just tell them not to use Wikipedia, and that could be a you know a big influence in in their actual use of Wikipedia during the semester they they surveyed. So, yeah, and and that that is it for my presentation. Sam, thanks a lot. This was really awesome. I have to say, I have many reasons why I really liked this paper. Can can folks guess what they are? I don't know the reason, but I I have some concerns about why or how they can draw the conclusion that they made in this paper, which is they don't think、uh, the outcome expectation is a mediator because. What they're reporting is that they don't see a significant result, but usually, simply because you don't see a significant result doesn't mean it's not a mediator.、Um, so there are a couple of things. Firstly, I think it's have some.、Um, it it somehow has something similar to a mediator because if you control for these variables. The variables that have significant correlation before are not significant correlated, so it has something similar to a mediator.、Uh, second,、uh, that usually people are conservative to interpret a non-significant result because there are many reasons that will lead to a non-significant result because of low statistical power that、uh, we know type two error are common. Uh, and also because of the multicollinearity stuff, that is might it's possible that outcome expectation are correlated with the other variables, which inflate inflates the standard deviation, which makes the result insignificant.、Mm -hmm. Standard errors, but yes,、uh, I I agree with this.、Um, but at the same time, so let me not focus on the negatives for a minute. Because there were really lots of awesome things I, I thought in this paper, so I want to highlight some of the good things. There's this very common tendency, especially among junior researchers and junior faculty members, when they are serving on review boards and program committees and so on, to be overly negative. I've、uh, commented on this in the past, so I, I want to also highlight a few really、uh, cool things、uh, I think about this paper.、Um, In, in addition to just some of the things that could have been、uh, improved, 
So what, what, what are some things that were really cool about this paper? I think there were a few. I, I liked a few personally. Looking at people I haven't heard from yet, people that are hiding in the shadows of the, the Zoom gallery. Is there anything that you liked about this study? Um, I guess one thing that stands out is that they had some uh, like well grounded theory that they were basing their research on. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep, that's a big plus for me. Anything else? Can you go back to that survey instrument you have, Sam? That was also something that I so stood out to me as particularly impressive. What do you see here, if anything? This is sort of a flashback many lectures ago when we talked about surveys. They have this alpha test to measure the robustness of the survey. Okay, yeah, but more specifically, what kind of instrument is this? Like scale? Uh, no, yes, but no, that's sort of the type of answer. What, what's cool about this? Anyone? Hana, Jenna, Deun, Kyle. Simon, Austin, Jeremy. Anything cool about this? Uh, I mean, none of the, these are well-constructed survey items for sure. None of them are like, normative or point toward a correct answer. But why, why is this? Okay, yes. And, and the way the specific questions, the individual questions are phrased, yes. But what else? So one, one level higher. Let me try differently. How many conceptual variables are there on the, in the first column? I don't know, some number. Uh, right? six. <laughs> I can't, I can't for some reason. Yeah, six-ish. Okay, yeah. So how many items are there? Many more than six. Ah. Why is that a cool thing? Because together you'll get more information about a variable than if you had just asked one small question mm -hmm. about the, the whole thing. Mm -hmm. uh, if it, the question was, how much does your, my past experience influences whether I use Wikipedia? This is a pretty terrible question, but instead you poke at it with very small specific questions. Yeah, right. So for every conceptual variable, you need at least one survey item, right? Asking about that, trying to measure that variable, right? Then um, why this is cool, I claim, uh, and we sort of talked about this, I don't know, many lectures ago when we talked about survey design, is that they have this multi-item scale instead of a single item scale for every one of their variables so that they can capture more dimensions of the same conceptual variable here, right? And they go through this trouble, as Bilbo mentioned, of sort of computing the sort of reliability of this um, scale and these different uh, items on the scale and, and so on and so uh, confirming that they all point in the same direction and they also contribute to explaining this conceptual variable and 
uh, it's always more than just the one uh, item that tries to capture this conceptual variable. So this is a much more reliable way of capturing these, measuring these conceptual variables than if I had just asked, I could have just asked one item, one question for every conceptual variable, right? But that, that arguably uh, would have been much less reliable than what they've done here. Like I, I trust their measurements of these conceptual variables much more here because they have this multi-item scale to capture those. And, and so we had a discussion back then of, of why this is more reliable. So this is one thing that I found particularly cool. Is it strange that most of these answers are on the are on one side of the scale um, rather than, I mean, does this say anything about your survey construction if most of your answers are in the four or five range instead of across the whole scale of answers? Um, well, four here is actually the midpoint, right? Because it's a one to seven. Right. And, but I'm, I'm, what I'm pointing out is that most things are to the like conceptual right of four. They're greater than four. Um, yeah. Yeah, you're right. I, I suspect one, one possible reason is that most of these um, scales are just phrased positively. Right. There was some bias that we talked about back then. So people tend to agree with you when you ask them questions. Also, Kyle showed up, I think. The other Kyle, the cat Kyle. Yes. Kevin. Kevin. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, Kyle. I think there is a cat Kyle also. There, there is a Kyle. I don't know where he is right now. Yeah. Um, all right. Yeah, cool. So this wasn't, uh, I think this was very, very nice. I, I really liked sort of the theoretical buildup and how their analysis was very well grounded in theory. They didn't just throw stuff at the regression model, but they sort of had very good reasons for including or, or not things in their models. Uh, and uh, I think overall, lots of care with I mean, measuring things and the analysis from what it seems, very detailed description of all of the methodology steps in the analysis. I also like the discussion at the end where they tried to so connect the results back to the original theory that they started from and so discussing implications for that theory that they started from. Uh, in this case, the implication was that you know maybe a revision of that theory is, is required. So that was that was pretty cool. I liked how honest they were with uh, some of the limitations. Uh, I think the one that Bobo raised um, is also one that came to my mind as I was listening to this, the one about insufficient statistical power to conclude the lack of a non-effect here. Um, so I, I don't know what the sample size from the survey was. How many responses did, did they have? Do you remember, Sam? Um, I think uh, I think they, they had, um, in the end, they had about 130 responses. And, and they surveyed... Um, well, they, I, I guess they tried to survey about 400 students. So they have a response rate about 30% and they have a, about a, 130 responses. It's possible that 130 is just not enough when you're having so many variables in a regression model and you're computing so many correlations, doing so many tests. It's possible it's just not enough. So it could be that their study was underpowered, like Bobo said, and um, maybe that thing actually is a mediator, but they just did not have enough power to detect that it is. I think I think that's valid. You know, I don't know necessarily that I, have, I haven't read the paper in detail recently, but I don't know that they necessarily exclude that possibility uh, from their conclusions. Like I don't know that they claim very definitively that that thing is not a mediator um, so much that they claim that they, they haven't in the study, they haven't found enough evidence that it is a mediator, which is sort of how I would phrase it. So I, I, you know, I would add to the list of threats the limitations that maybe we just don't have enough power to detect that this thing is a mediator here, and we're leaving that option open for another study, or for a replication in the future. I think overall, so to me, this was very, very nice. Like lots of lots of good stuff in here. Like you know, the solid theory and very well designed analysis based on that theory, contributions back, reflections onto the theory at the end, strong measurement, the analysis seems um, seems strong. So like overall, I think a really good example of how to do this.
Any more thoughts on this before the next one? All right, so how about we do the democracy one? Can do that. I mean, if the resolution on that is not okay. I, I, can, um, I can see that. Yeah, looks good. Okay, so this is one of the papers that I had to read for my other class in international security. Uh, so democracy and military effectiveness by Biddle and Long. Um, so back in the 90s, there was uh, a lot of work around correlating regime type, particularly democracy, with the outcome of wars. People noticed that democratic regimes tended to win wars more often than other types of regimes. So this is one of the papers that's looking into why that might be the case. Um, initially, a lot of people were looking at um, uh, force multiplier types of things, like how many tanks and guns you have and how the quality of tanks and guns and those sorts of things. Um, and then in looking at the democratic regimes, uh, some of the arguments for that were, you know, maybe it's because democratic decision making results in better decisions, or maybe it's because uh, leadership styles tend to uh, supports lower level leadership and better decision making, uh, tactical decision making during battle, or maybe it has to do with economic performance, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so this paper in particular is looking at the effects of human capital. So education of citizens, skill levels, um, health, things like that. Uh, civil military relations as a second variable and cultural background uh, of democracies. So the, the gap, I guess, here is uh, they're trying to explore the mechanism uh, by which democracies are better militarily. And the hook, I suppose, is that they want to be able to use that information to predict the military outcomes for particular battles between different states. So I mentioned these are their three variables, human capital, civil military relations, and culture. Um, and they're looking at correlations between those and also those um, force uh, magnifying variables that I mentioned earlier. So uh, they, they do mention in their paper that their findings uh, will, the use of their findings will be dependent on whether people believe that these three different variables are caused by democracy or whether those three variables cause democracy. So uh, they don't explore that relationship, but they note that their results will be affected by uh, different beliefs for that particular relationship. I can explain that more in a little bit. Um, so this was their approach. They looked through some of the literature on this cause and effect for democratic regimes and identify their hypotheses through that literature. They talk about the data set and limitations on that, talk about their variables, and then they do a regression analysis. So they chose for their data to use battle outcomes rather than war outcomes because that gives them a much larger data set to work with, a lot more battles than wars. Um, and also because they're looking at combat effectiveness, which you can't really get at with whether or not someone won an entire war. So they choose the six variables here, material quantity, how many tanks and guns you have, material quality, how good those tanks and guns are, regime type itself, so whether or not it's democratic, and then those other three variables that they're adding in as new to this set of literature. Uh, and they identify a hypothesis for each one of those different variables. So as the example of material quantity, battle outcome should improve with more weapons. Um, and the other ones are kind of uh, similar in that way. So human capital, again, skills, health, literacy rates. So same thing, battle outcome should improve when you have more educated, healthier citizens. 
I won't go into detail on the others. They're all pretty straightforward. Uh, so as far as the data set, they used a couple of data sets that are common in this IR theory and security uh, literature. They looked at uh, whether or not they were double counted. They took some of those out. They took the double counted ones out. Uh, and they also looked at the reliability of the other data and made some changes where appropriate. And they do go into detail on how many changes they had to make and that sort of thing. So their dependent variable was battle outcomes. And they actually they measured this in terms of loss exchange ratio. So that's the number of casualties for each side rather than just a binary battle outcome. And they did this as the regression analysis and three different models. So the first model they had just looked at what the previous literature had already looked at, and they basically confirmed um, material quantity, quality, and democratic regime type does have a statistically significant effect. Uh, but their particular contribution was this second model, which added in those other three variables. And they determined that that actually increases that, uh, that effect uh, by an order of magnitude based on the R squared. And then they also did a third variable or a third model, sorry, uh, taking out the cultural variable to try to see how much of an effect that cultural variable was having on uh, the outcome. And show the, the important part here, all of the numbers. So these are their results. Um, I can see here, uh, everything that's starred is statistically significant. Standard errors are in parentheses in this case. Um, and these are all of their variables on the left. The civ mill piece is the relationship between civil and military. And all of these down here are the binary relationships of, they're using religion in this case as a proxy for culture, uh, which they also acknowledge is not perfect, uh, but these are like MU is Muslim, JE is Jewish. So these are the binary relationships uh, for religions between the two different states. So their results for this uh, confirm uh, initially the literature saying that democracies uh, do have, a, have an, a beneficial effect on battle outcomes. But the three variables that they introduced have a much stronger effect than just the regime type. Uh, and in fact, if you add in these three variables that they did, it actually switches the sign of the regime type, which was interesting. Um, so their, their explanation there was that uh, was that causal difference between is democracy causing better civil military relations and human capital, or is it the human capital civil military relations that's causing the democratic regime that then affects the war outcome? Austin, I'm slightly confused about what the dependent variable here is. The, the dependent variable is the battle outcome. So it's a binary one zero. It's, it's a loss exchange ratio. It's the number of casualties for the attacker versus the number of casualties for the defender. And more negative is more good for in this, I guess. No. I'm trying to. I can't. Um, I, so I don't think it matters. Yes. Okay. Yeah. 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 Sorry. So yes, negative is good. So for this first model, uh, democracy, the regime type democracy is a better outcome than other, like uh, better than autocracy, for example. Uh, in this case, when they added in these other variables that are new to this type of analysis, uh, the democracy piece switched to negative. So democracy, assuming you're accounting for all the human capital and civil military relations, 
democracy negatively influences your battle outcome. That is interesting. Yeah. I actually curious why the artillery preference is positively correlated with the with the loss exchange ratio, which means negatively affect the outcome. Is it a definitely good thing if we have higher prevalence of artillery? Uh, you think so? I didn't. So I didn't look closely at these variables, actually. So I would have to dig more into, and they didn't go into it very much either. But I could dig into it a little bit. But yeah, it's a good question because all of the all of the good stuff is negative, so to speak. Yeah, I can dig into that. This is the tank. Tank is negative and aircraft is negative as well. Can you see more, more what the pairs are, the four letter acronyms there? These are the religions of, I believe the, the first two letters are the targeted state, the defender, and the second two letters are for the attacking state. So I believe PC is Christian, so Christian versus Christian, Christian versus Buddhists. This is in the paper, I, just, I don't have it memorized. Christian versus Muslim. So they had, to, they had to find a way to code culture into their analysis, and they, that's the way that they did it. Typically with these factors, there's some reference level. Like what, what is the reference here? So, um, for example, like how do I interpret these, say Christian versus Christian versus what's the baseline? Or is there a baseline or is there some global average that's me being there, used as... They used a scale of some sort, which they have in here somewhere, where they explained how they coded all of this. For some reason, I'm not it. So, in other words, uh, we had this example of um, I don't know modeling binary gender or something in a, in the last lecture or so, um, and there we saw that uh, essentially you can only have one of the values of this factor, one of the levels, be represented in the regression model because the other one is sort of used implicitly as the reference. So you can't have both at the same time. It's sort of one at, relative to the other is kind of the, the estimated the effect so here i'm imagining there should be something that's not displayed in the regression summary that you've shown that's being used as the reference um i don't i don't see them I and mean, they're saying here a series of dummy variables um so that I, it seems like a binary variable um, for whether that that pair was part of that particular piece of data. Mm -hmm. So I don't know that there is, I mean, they're not saying here that there is a, a baseline for it. Mm -hmm. But I, yeah, I don't know. Other questions on this part? It seems you're, the other thing that stands out to me you're going from 4% or 8% explanatory power without religion or culture to 42%. So that's a huge jump there. Yeah. Yeah, and that was their argument that those variables contribute more. Um, so they, they ended up disproving, or, you know, according to this data set, disproving uh, the the initial literature for decades on this, that you know, more tanks uh, is what decides battle outcomes. Uh, and that they're saying here, human capital is more important. And in particular, culture is really important, uh, but they do recognize that religion is not a perfect proxy for culture. Do you think there's any risk of overfitting this with, um only 223 entries in the data set? Yeah, um, there were a couple other papers, I'm not gonna go through them, but I had them pulled up um, that were looking at this same data set and doing similar regression analyses, but they actually, they code the data differently um, and they use different variables as part of their regressions. 
uh, and come out with, they all come out with the same conclusions, but the other papers don't have statistically significant conclusions just because they chose to include, um, one of the other ones includes um, draw versus win versus loss instead of this casualty ratio. Um, similar conclusion, but not statistically significant. So I think that's where some of the issues with this why is in how that data set is being used. Mm -hmm. The other thing that strikes me as interesting or, or questionable is, uh, I, I don't know enough about military battles, but I imagine there's all kinds of other confounding factors that are important. So I don't know to what extent um, they've included all the ones that matter or, or sort of excluded some that may matter. I, I don't know about enough about the domain to, to say that. Do you have a sense? Well, I mean, that's exactly what they're trying to figure out as part of this paper. And the initial literature, you know, decades or even hundreds of years ago was focusing on that, the force material, um, numbers and quantity and, you know, technology and, and things like that. And they're adding in these uh, newer or modern, maybe, variables, trying to figure out that specific question that you're asking. And that's, you know, still ongoing, right? Is there any discussion of diagnostics uh, for this model? Was there like issues of multicollinearity or outliers or stuff like that? No, they didn't really get into that. Um, they mentioned, like I said, the religion piece not being the greatest proxy for this. Um, they mentioned the data sets probably have errors in them. You know, they did kind of a cursory look, but they didn't go through every single data point and check it against historical literature. Um, their argument for that was that um, even if there is some measurement error in there, it should be random uh, and therefore would not affect their conclusions. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know what these data sets look like, so I don't know if that's true, uh, but that was their assessment. That's For what it's worth, that's an argument we also often make in similar observational studies, the argument that Yes, you know, these measurements are imperfect and whatnot, but unless we have strong reason to believe they're necessarily biased in one particular direction, we can just sort of assume that the, the bias and noise is randomly distributed and um, we'll just sort of drown out uh, the main effect somewhat, but won't, won't bias it in the opposite direction or, or something like that. You'll still be able to detect that if it's there. Like, typically, the, so the difference between the kinds of observational studies that I've seen done uh, in this area of empirical software engineering or online communities versus some of these other ones, both the Wikipedia one and this one, is that the data sets we tend to work with are several orders of magnitudes larger. Like we, we tend to work with tens of thousands of observations casually versus a few hundred observations. I think some of these issues of um, lack of statistical power and so on um, tend to be alleviated just because in our domain, we tend to have access to more data. Yeah, that makes sense. And also that just reminded me of the artillery pre prevalence question. I think Bo had this data set is from newer battles like within the last hundred years or so. And the outcomes of those rely a lot more on tank and aircraft than they do on guns and people. Mm -hmm. So that's probably why, but they didn't say that in the paper specifically. Anyway, I thought it was an interesting example and I was reading it anyway from the other class. Yeah, cool, thanks. thanks for the presentation. I guess since we're out of time, uh, how about we push the other two for, for next week? Uh, there's no point in staying over now. Right, so thanks to presenters. And is there anything else I can help answer or clarify about anything for adjourning? We had three cats today, so I'm hoping for at least uh, at least three or more next time. Should be a monotonically increasing number of pets. Yeah, yeah I've, I've counted yours too, Austin. There were two others in here, but you didn't see another gun. So hopefully Jeremy can provide more cats next time.
I, I actually can. All right, thanks. Thanks, everyone. I'll see you next time.